special matters. Speaker convenes a special party leaders meeting over a debate on bond inquiry report. It's a lie. Former Finance Minister Ravi Karuna Naik insists that the revelations made through the bond inquiry report are false. Highlighting gaps. The chairman of Jetwing Symphony says Sri Lanka's tourism industry lacks a concerted destination marketing effort. Contradictions. Author of the book Fire and Fury, inside the Trump White House insists he had dialogue with Trump when writing the book. Heading towards victory. Australia makes England toil in the field with little reward. Bring you news from home and across the world. This is First at Nine, another there in a 24-7. Good evening, I'm Katharina Chang. Now, want your top story tonight. Speaker Karuja Surya has convened a special party leaders meeting next Tuesday. It is reported that the special meeting is called to decide a date to convene the parliament following the request of party leaders to hold a debate on the bond inquiry report. The media unit of the speaker mentioned that the party leaders are informed of the meeting in writing. In the meantime, various views were expressed on the report produced following the bond inquiry in the political arena today as well. The entire report is in the excess of 1,100 pages and the president is only limiting his elaborations to two pages. If the president hides this report until the election is over, that will result in the people losing their right to vote against those who are involved in this theft. The prime minister is culpable of violating the constitution since Arjun Mahendran gave evidence before the commission saying he did not officially swear. In his speech, the president says that senior officials at the central bank relented to the influence of Arjun Mahendran. He has used the power of the Prime Minister to strike fear into these officials at the central bank. Has the government taken any measures to stop Ravi Karunanayaka or Loshis from selling their assets? We request the Attorney General to obtain an order from court and freeze these assets, since if they sell them, from what is the loss supposed to be recovered? Arjuna Mahendran clearly states that it was the Prime Minister who advised for this as the subject minister. The Prime Minister can't evade the responsibility. I request that the fact to be taken before court not be obfuscated. Some say that they are innocent since the President didn't mention their names. Maybe the President pitied them. The Prime Minister could expedite the court proceedings. It would be better if the Prime Minister follows the example set by Ravi. This was well planned by the UNP. A vast sum of state funds was legally robbed by a company and then a portion from the mammoth sum from that company was used to expand the party's funds and start TV channels. This is the real story. <laughs> President Maitripala Sirisena appointed a commission and its report has been sent to the Attorney General. The President and the Prime Minister don't have police powers to make arrests. It could only be done upon a court order and the Mahinda faction doesn't understand this. <laughs> Some aided the robbery while others aided its cover-up. It is, however, a question that the Commission's report doesn't contain a decision on either faction. Irrespective of the government they represent, this president and the government will show no mercy to thieves. We brought in Maithri Pala Sirisena and they cannot claim him. Therefore, it is us who caught this bond scam. The Prime Minister testified before court. Has that happened anywhere in the world? Over 11 billion rupees of public money was stolen by Arjun Alosius. A scanner could have been purchased for every hospital in the country with that money at 200 million each. The Presidential Commission has determined that Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe is in no way responsible for this issue. It was President Maitri Palasiri Sen who brought the thief from Singapore for the central bank scam and Ranil Vikramasinghe aided it. Those two are responsible for the scam.
Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singh says that he gave instructions for the bond inquiry report to be forwarded to the Attorney General. The Premier made the acknowledgement today while responding to questions raised by media in Kandy. Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singh, who arrived in Kandy this morning, called on the Chief Prelate of the Malvatu Chapter, Most Venerable Tibotu Avestri Sumangala Thera. <laughs> The Premier then engaged in religious observances at the Temple of the Sacred Tooth Relic. Prime Minister Vikramasinghe then called on the Chief Prelate of the Asgiri Chapter, Most Venerable Varka Goda Srinyana Ratanathera. I met both chief prelates. We discussed the progress of development, worshipped the tooth relic and concluded affairs. Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe then attended a function held at the Kandy District Secretariat and declared open the new auditorium. Today everyone is talking about the traffic congestion in the city of Kandy. They closed the road near the temple of the tooth relic without any discussion. That's how the congestion started. A tunnel is the only solution for this issue. We've got Korean funds now. We're going to continue with these projects in the coming years. We're trying to make Kandy a hub of this country country and a step towards this end is giving prominence to the Kandy Highway. When all this concludes by 2020, I think it will take around three to four hours to reach Hambantota from Kandy via the highway. We're making preliminary plans for the city of Kandy. We're building a cultural centre in Bogambara so that the tourists will stay in Kandy for a couple more days. President Maitri Pala Sirisena says that ministerial secretaries have to ensure state property is not used in election activities. During a discussion with ministerial secretaries yesterday, the head of state said it is their responsibility to do so. The presidential secretariat hosted the discussion between the president Maitri Pala Sirisena and secretaries of ministries last evening. Ministerial secretaries have a responsibility to ensure that property of ministries is not used in election activities, especially vehicles. It's good to have a clear principle on it. The difference about the election laws of this election is that there used to be an election commissioner before and now there is an election commission. The commission has more power. We know that law is implemented better than previous occasions. Not only the assets of ministries but other departments, corporations and various institutions which fall under the ministries should also be used wisely. What I observed last year that both minister and the secretary go on foreign tours at the same time. But both can't go abroad at the same time and there are circulars pertaining to it. I hope that mistake won't be repeated this year. In the meantime, several candidates of the Sri Lanka Podujana Perumuna met the president today and pledged support in the upcoming elections. Meanwhile, Sarala Atulat Mudali, the daughter of late politician Lalit Atulat Mudali, also met the president at his official residence and pledged support to his attempts in taking the country forward. With the local government polls within touching distance, the first election rally of the Sri Lanka Podujana Perumuna commenced today in Kadavata. The rally was worked off under the patronage of former President Mahindra Raja Paksha. The first election rally of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna was worked off in Karavata today. The rally was themed Building the Country Again. The MPs of the Joint Opposition as well as other party leaders contesting under the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna participated in the rally. It was conducted under the patronage of former President Mahindra Raja Paksha. <laughs> The leader of the youngsters contesting from the UNP, who claim to be clean, is in fact the biggest thief in the country. If the finance minister of the country is involved in stealing money, we demand that all the UNP ministers and MPs involved in it resign from the government. For the ones who said that we are lying, I say, it has been revealed that the Prime Minister's Cabinet of Ministers, officials and all others who are around him should be held responsible for the bond scam. At this moment, where attempts are made to divide this country through a constitution which leads towards an elam, 
we should use our votes as a referendum, objecting the division of the country. This is an unstable government where ministers are fighting among themselves. There is a cold war between the prime minister and the president. This is what we see, and a government cannot run this way. A government should move ahead with a stable policy, but there is no policy. We told you earlier that this is a pickle. This government is in a muddle, so you have to take the right decision on the 10th. Police has decided to ramp up their efforts to arrest persons with warrants against their name and raids on illegal for forearms. Addressing a media briefing, Police Media Spokesperson S.P. Ruan Gunasekar said that the Inspector General of Police instructed to give relevant police officers financial incentives. The Inspector General of Police gave special directions to all the police stations. One of them used to use road barriers for a couple of hours to search for suspicious vehicles until the 1st of March. The other directive is that to increase the number of arrests of those with warrants against them. The police officer who arrests a person with a warrant issued against him will be given a cash reward of 1,500 rupees. That amount could increase to 5,000 rupees depending on the seriousness of the suspect. Another directive given by the Inspector General of Police is to carry out special raids in search of illegal firearms and the police officers who arrest suspects with illegal firearms will also be given cash rewards. If a suspect is arrested with a T-56 gun, that police officer will be given a cash reward of 100,000 rupees. A pistol or a revolver along with the suspect will fetch 50,000 rupees. For a suspect with a hand grenade, the cash reward would be 15,000 rupees and for a Galkatas, it would be a 10,000 rupee reward. Right Reverend Deva Priya Kirti Siri Fernando was ordained today as the sixth bishop of the Kurunagar Diocese of the Church of Ceylon. His enthronement service took place at the Cathedral Church of Christ, the King in Kurunagala today. Right Reverend Kirti Siri Fernando was called to serve the Lord on May 21, 1989, when he was ordained as a deacon and later ordained into priesthood on November 30, 1990. Thereafter, he served as a parish priest in Badulla, Mathura, Gaul and Moratua in the Diocese of Colombo. Bishop Kirti Siri Fernando is an expert in interfaith dialogue and has written extensively on Christian-Buddhist relationships. The Bishop of Colombo, Right Reverend Dilo Raj Kanagasabe, presided over the enthronement ceremony attended by Buddhist clergy. My main emphasis will be how to live as brothers and sisters by comprehending diversity in this country. I'll be working hard to bring that vision a reality in this country. Let's now take a look at a few other stories making news across Sri Lanka. A 16-year-old youth who went missing with his friends at Punnakuda Beach in Iravur last evening drowned when he was caught in a current. His body, which was reported missing following the incident, was discovered on the beach this morning. Ten dogs died when they consumed a slab of meat discarded by a meat shop in Deltota last night. The Galaha police commence investigations following a complaint lodged by residents. The Negro Dharama temples Durutu Mahaperahara in Hatton took to the streets last night. The procession comprised of traditional dance and art depicting the culture of all regions in the country. Foreign cigarettes worth 60,000 rupees and 25,000 US dollars was confiscated by airport customs last evening. The items were in possession of a Sri Lankan businessman who arrived from India. Watching Sri Lanka's award winning news channel, Other Verena 24 7. Chairman of Jet Wing Symphony Hiran Kure says Sri Lanka tourism industry lacks a concerted destination marketing effort, hampering development of the industry. Jetwing Symphony listed five of its companies on the Colombo Stock Exchange yesterday, being the first company to go public in 2018. Speaking at the ceremony, Chairman of Jetwing Symphony added that two other properties are in the pipeline to be listed.
Jetwing Symphony Limited rang the opening bell to commence trading on the Colombo Bourse and celebrate the listing of its shares as the first listing at the Colombo Stock Exchange for 2018. The listing follows an initial public offering by the company in December 2017 through which it raised 753 million rupees via a 50.22 million share issue. The five listed companies are Jetwing Yala, Jetwing Khadruketa, Jetwing Lake, Jetwing Surf and Jetwing Colombo 7. I am sure even for you as the company it's an important occasion where I think after about 10 years of operation Jetwing Symphony now is going to transform itself from a private company to a public listed company and once you are a public listed company there are certain obligations and responsibilities particularly to corporate citizen like Jetwing I think who are well aware of all the obligations so I am sure that you all will live up to the expectations of all those who invested in the share issue that you had recently and create wealth for your shareholders. So we have no doubt that as a company that you will do well and be in the forefront of uh, our listed company fraternity. I know the journey to the listing has been a long one, but uh, nothing in life comes easy as they say. It was a wish that uh, many people, as Rajiv himself mentioned, that we list something and that's how this all came about in 2011 when we decided that we'll start a company that will be the vehicle of growth for Jetwing in the future and that's the company that we wanted to list and there we are after having completed five hotels and uh, with two more on the pipeline. We are a company we have not looked at many you know outside support it's a journey that we've started and uh, we believe that sri lanka has a has a lot of potential the destination lacks a proper marketing program uh, that's that's common knowledge everybody is aware that uh, we are crying uh, for a destination marketing program and that's so far not happened so in that respect uh, the support that we really need hasn't happened, but we can't only blame the government as well because the private sector is also in, on those boards. Indonesia hopes to achieve trade worth 50 billion US dollars with India by 2025. The intentions were made clear by the country's foreign minister at a joint news conference with her Indian counterpart in Jakarta yesterday. No Marsudi, speaking after meeting India's Foreign Minister Shushma Swaraj in Indonesia's capital, said the pair had also agreed to cooperate on fighting terrorism, organized crime and cyber threats. In the latest World Economic League table, India looks set to leapfrog Britain and France this year to become the world's fifth largest economy in dollar terms. India's ascent is part of a trend that will see Asia's economies increasingly dominate the top 10 largest economies over the next 15 years. Venezuela is issuing 5.9 billion US dollars in Petro, its state cryptocurrency, in the hopes that it will drive the country out of economic downfall amid US sanctions. The Petro is backed by the country's oil, diamond and gold reserves. The move comes after President Nicolas Maduro's announcement yesterday that Venezuela would issue 100 million units of its new oil-backed cryptocurrency. President Nicolas Maduro said yesterday that Venezuela would issue 100 million units of its new oil-backed cryptocurrency in coming days, although it is unclear whether any investors will want to purchase the Petro at a time when the OPEC member is going through a deep economic crisis and its leftist government has little credibility. Socialist Maduro surprised many last month when he announced the launch of the cryptocurrency to be backed by Venezuela's oil, gas, gold and diamond reserves as a way to circumvent US sanctions that have hurt Venezuela's access to international banks. Maduro specified that each unit of the currency would be pegged to Venezuela's oil basket, which this week averaged $59.07 per barrel. That implies the total cryptocurrency issued would be worth just over $5.9 billion. US dollars. The United States and South Korea yesterday completed the first round of review talks on a bilateral trade deal with Washington saying there was much work to do to reach a new pact. Since taking office in 2017, President Donald Trump has pulled the United States out of talks on a 14-nation Asia-Pacific trade pact, started negotiations on a new deal for the North American Free Trade Agreement between the US, Mexico and Canada and initiated a review of the 2012 Korea deal. 
Washington has taken a hard line in the NAFTA talks, which appears stalled with just two rounds of negotiations left, saying that concessions are the only way for Canada and Mexico to keep the deal. The U.S. goods trade deficit with South Korea has doubled since the 2012 signing of the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, almost 90% of the 2016 shortfall of $27.6 billion came from the auto, sec auto sector, an issue the United States is expected to press hard in the Washington talks. A quick Korea deal could give Trump his first trade victory at a time when NAFTA negotiations are dragging on and pressure on China to change the trade practices has yielded little progress. The author of a deeply critical book about Donald Trump's first year in office, Michael Wolff, insists that he spoke with the president while working on it, contradicting Trump's assertion that he had never talked to the writer for the book and had authorized zero access to the White House. Wolf told NBC yesterday that he stood by his reporting and had talked to the president for the book. Michael Wolff's book, Fire and Fury, Inside the Trump White House, Dismissed by Trump as full of lies, depicts a chaotic White House, a president who was ill-prepared to win the office in 2016, and Trump aides who scorned his abilities. What, what was I doing there if, um, um, if he didn't want me to be there? I absolutely spoke to the president, whether he realized it was an interview or not. Um, I, I don't know, but it certainly was not off the record. My, my credibility is being questioned by a man who has less credibility than perhaps anyone who has ever walked on earth at this point. I will tell you the one description that, that everyone gave, everyone has in common. They all say he is like a child. And what they mean by that is he has an, a need for immediate gratification. It's all about him. I, actually, there's a competition to sort of get to the bottom line here of who this man is. Let's remember, this man does not read, does not listen. So uh, he, he, he's, he's, like a, um, he's like a pinball, just, just, just shooting off the side. We thought this presidency was, could work. We thought Donald Trump is an interesting, unique character, and, and we might be able to do something here. And they saw him over that time come to the conclusion he cannot do this job. France's ambassador to the United Nations told a UN Security Council meeting yesterday that recent protests in Iran do not threaten international peace and security in what may be an implicit criticism of the United States for calling the meeting. Also during the meeting, Iran's ambassador to the United Nations said that his government has hard evidence that recent protests in Iran were very clearly directed from abroad. The United States stands unapologetically with those in Iran who seek freedom for themselves, prosperity for their families, and dignity for their nation. We will not be quiet. No dishonest attempt to call the protesters puppets of foreign powers will change that. However worrying the events of the last few days in Iran may be, they do not constitute per se a threat to international peace and security. We must react appropriately to what has been going on, but we must be wary of any attempts to exploit this crisis for personal ends which could have a dramatically opposed outcome to that which is wished. Mr. President, today we are witnessing how the United States is abusing the platform of the Security Council. Why is the United States a permanent member of the Security Council and one of the authors of the UN Charter undermining the authority of the Security Council as the main body which is responsible for maintaining international peace and security? It is unfortunate that despite the resistance on the part of some of its members, this council has allowed itself to be abused by the current U.S. administration in holding a meeting on an issue that falls outside the scope of its mandate. Mr. President, we have hard evidence of the violence in Iran by a handful of the protesters, in some cases resulting in the deaths of policemen and security officers being very clearly directed from abroad. 
Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Verana 24-7. Australia looks to be laying the foundation for victory in the fifth Ashes test with the home side ending the day on 479 for the loss of four wickets with a further two full days play left. They now lead England by 130 runs in the first innings. Aussie captain Stephen Smith and Usman Khawaja resumes the innings this morning with the score on 193 for two. Khawaja soon brought up his century and Smith also notched up another 50. Second 50 was fantastic. Great control. The duo added 81 runs when the shock of day happened. Smith, considered to be the immovable object, fell for 83 as he was caught and bowled by Moeen Ali. That didn't deter the home side and they went from strength to strength. Kawaja looked in very good nick and went past 150 and partnering up with Sean Marsh, they added 101 runs to the overall tally before Kawaja was stumped for 171 off leg spinner Mason Crane's bowling. It was the 20-year-old's maiden wicket in Test cricket. Then came the moment where brothers were reunited at the crease. Brothers Sean and Mitchell Marsh got together and accelerated in the last two hours, with Mitchell in particular going after Ali's spin. Sean, had an accelerator of his own. Sean was closing in on a century but couldn't get there before the play ended for the day and will resume day four on 98. Mitchell Marsh brought up his 63 runs in just 87 deliveries and looked solid at the crease. Australia will start day four on 479 for four. 133 runs. Nick Kyrgios turned on the style in time to beat Ukraine's Alexander Dolkopolov at the Brisbane International yesterday. Top seed and holder Grigor Dimitrov also came through in his quarter-final. The mercurial Australian Kyrgios huffed and puffed in a miserable first set but eventually found some rhythm to come through a tricky encounter against Dolkopolov 1-6, 6-3, 6-4. With the win, Kyrgyz set up a semi-final clash with Bulgarian Dimitrov, who had to battle hard against Britain's Kylie Edmund, winning 6-3, 6-7, 6-4 in 2 hours and 23 minutes at the Petra after Arena. Dimitrov was in control against Edmund as he took the first set but was dragged into a second set tiebreak, which the Britain edged to set up the decider. Dimitrov, who survived two match points to beat local hope John Millman in the previous round, needed a solitary break to close out the match. Kyrgios was joined in the last four by fellow Australian Alex Dimina as the teenager followed up his win over Milos Raonic by beating American qualifier Michael Moore 6-4, 6-0. Let's now cross over to Shinla Fernando at the Adha Dharana Weather Centre for your forecast first evening edition. Good evening and welcome to Forecast First. Your temperatures for tomorrow are to vary between 14 and 29 degrees Celsius with the lowest temperatures being expected in the central hills. When we look at the map, we can expect some clear skies with low precipitation in most regions of the island over the course of tomorrow. Well, it will be a very sunny day for Jaffna, Mena and Anuradhapura as well as Trincomalee. Some cloudy skies can be experienced in Matara, Nigambo and Hambantota. That's all we have from the weather center tonight. Up next is your city by city forecast. And that's it for tonight. When you have the time, make sure you connect with us on Facebook by going to facebook.com forward slash first at nine. Also on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash first at nine. But before we go, we'd like to take you to Canada, where the frozen Niagara Falls is dazzling its visitors with wondrous beauty. Have a pleasant evening.
the news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Varana 24-7.